this exhibition represents actually just one iteration of a multi-year collaboration between those of us at NYU and Red Canary Song. So mark your calendars, we have the opening today. Um, but later on the semester, we'll have a screening of the documentary Fly in Power about Red Canary Song. Um, and we'll have a Q&A with, with the filmmakers afterwards. Um, and then on December 5th, we'll have a closing event. The exhibition closes that week, so we'll have a closing event on December 5th which will involve a roundtable of scholars and activists working specifically on questions of sex work in a global frame. So we'll have activists and scholars from the Caribbean, um, those working on sex work in um, Southeast Asia. So please do come to that. Um, and that will also involve a closing ceremony and performance by Red Canary Song. So to my mind, and the reason why I really wanted to partner with Red Canary Song um, is because they're really doing some of the most imaginative and really most brilliant, sophisticated theorizing around questions of labor, migration, care work, um, sex, and um, gender that I see happening today. So I'm deeply honored to be in community with Red Canary Song. And so without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Eves, who's one of the organizers for Red Canary Song, and then you'll hear from Yung Q and Chang Gu, who are the curators. Hi everyone, I'm Eves and I'm an organizer with Red Canary Song. And we always do a land acknowledgement for the indigenous peoples whose land we reside and organize on at our events. But before I do that, I want to acknowledge that we're coming to this space during an ongoing and escalating genocide that we are all bearing witness to. We're a collective of Asian and migrant massage workers and sex workers who fight every day for migrant justice and the right to survive against the very foundations for which the US and Israel are built upon. White supremacy, imperialism, and colonialism. We have always held space for grief when we've lost our loved ones in our communities, and today, we mourn the lives lost in occupied Palestine. Their lives were, their deaths were not and are not inevitable because occupation is not inevitable. Colonialism is not inevitable. Genocide is not inevitable. We, they were not born to die or fight in wars created by states with borders that shouldn't exist. And the freedom to stay, to move, and to return means freedom for Palestine. With all that being said, we stand with all colonized, dispossessed, and oppressed people in their fight for freedom. We stand with all indigenous people's fight for land back, and we currently reside on the territory of the Lene Lenape, called Lenape Hoking. And there are still Lene Lenape people who are fighting for their lives and their land today. Whenever we do a land acknowledgement, we ask that folks join us in donating to the Nati Choke Lene Lenape Tribal Nation Land Acknowledgement Honorarium. Thank you. Mm. Organizer with Rekinari San and also a co curator together with Yin um, for the ex this exhibition. Um, firstly, I want to thank um, the AP Institute, in particular Laura and Amita, um, for inviting and setting up the show with us, and also Center for the Study of Gender and Sexuality, S gender and sexuality at NYU, and then Gachi and Robert for Im the invitation and also our own long-term collaboration mm -hmm. together, and also our recognized song members, translators, and assistants that have helped contributing to the show. Um, a little bit of the, the uh, uh, evolution of this, what you guys seeing in this space right now. Um, on November 27th, 25th, uh, 2017, Yan Son, an Asian migrant massage worker from China, fell four stories onto the sidewalk to her death during a police raid at a massage parlor she worked at in Flushing. Her death quickly triggered coalition responses amongst sex workers in New York City. A group of, a group of organizers in the King community protested against criminalization and created visuals in the streets of Flushing 
to help her family fundraise for medical expenses. These actions then developed into a sustained fight for justice and decriminalization, and later evolved into the Reconary Song that we know today. RCS continued to create visuals for our community in the most shared, in the shared most vulnerable moments uh, throughout the years. On March 16th, 2021, a young man filled with anti-Asian sentiments took away eight lives at two spas and one massage parlor in Atlanta. RCS organized an online vigil for, um, for our community members uh, who needed a shared moment of grief. And then for the one year anniversary of the tragic shooting, our community members put together a vigil for the lost lives in Washington Square Park, which was also supported by the CSGS. It was attended by over 200 people in person and thousands more online. That memorial was then, th that memorial was conceived as a simulacrum of a typical massage parlor as we were thinking about design for it mm -hmm. and it exposed the hidden workspace of the migrant work women workers that, uh, that call, who call those places home, but also um, a site of um, extreme violence that they suffer from. And, and inside of that installation, we invited our CES members to create altar tables for ritual practices that we performed at the vigil. And then since then, the RCS vigils have been reiterated and brought into a series of community space, spaces, including the Abrams Arts Center, and also recently to the storefront for ideas in Chinatown, which was run by Immigrant Social Services, mm -hmm. which, um, and there we participated in a pop art, pop, pop up community art exhibition called Archive as a Memorial, where Laura also participated, and then that's where we met, and then therefore Laura invited us here mm -hmm. to um, formalize this mm -hmm. body of work again in a new format um, mm -hmm. for everyone to see. So I'll hand over to Ian to talk more in detail about this exhibition in particular, and um, his name, our <laughs> pillar figure in RCS. <laughs> part of Reconary Song um, pretty much from the inception during, um, in 2018, the year after Yang Song had fallen to her death. Uh, we came together again really formalizing our, our collective to understand like, what we wanted to fight for and how we wanted to come together. However, you know, as all organizations go, it took a really long time to form. However, there's always been this, this um, common love for art, love for dialogue, um, and then also <laughs> love for food, and also our, our traditional cultural um, rituals that you see in front of you, which is, which is altar making, that we've, we've often come together to bring together um, our grief, our sorrow, but then also our celebrations and our reverence for life. Something I wanted to talk about when we, when we come to vigils, we, we still hold yearly vigils is that these are people mostly we didn't most of us don't know they are people however who have tugged at our hearts brought us and, and brought us together because so many of us including myself I've been in the sex industry for over 30 years so many of us have lost friends comrades lovers to the conditions that arise from the violence of, against sex workers, the stigma, the shame, whether it be actual physical violence against, from, from people, um, just people coming up against sex workers, um, or from police state, or from ourselves, from our mental anguish from the inside. Mm -hmm. So. Many of the workers come to these vigils. We have pocketfuls of names, of personal friends that we have lost, that we bring to the table. And that is also what the representation of the altar table is for us. There is abundance here. We always want to think about how can we send to our loved ones the most abundance of joy 
and love that possibly they did not receive during their lifetime. Something I was thinking about as I was invited to this space also is that being part of Red Canary Song for so many years, our goal was to uplift and advocate for the most marginalized, which is the mar marginalized, most, the migrant massage work, worker. However, many of us are kinks, kink workers. <laughs> we are dominatrixes, we are kink fetish workers. Um, and so something that I brought to the table of this proposal was, how do we tell that story of these two factions of sex workers coming together that seemingly don't have a lot of ties together? If you even think about the echelon of what we call horophobia within the industry, Many of the dominatrixes who came together, we are American born, we speak English, mm. we have documents. Mm. Many of us have had access to academics. Mm. So how do we want to actually come together with migrant massage workers to create the table together, to create the work together? But also, I wanted to pay homage to those of us who have come to set the table so something that Chong and I have, were talking about um, as we were curating this piece, and this is how we work together as, um, as a collective, is many of us will use our privilege to create the platforms, whether it's media, whether it's writing, whether it's a published book that will get to many academics, um, whether it's a gallery space. So we create the, the platform, but we are here actually for, because of the work that is being done from one person to another, one worker going to another worker in a spa and talking, getting to know them, getting them to trust us. That is the real work. The outreach teams, the Korean and Chinese speaking outreach teams that are here today, um, those are the people that we're working for the most in creating these spaces. I wanted also to talk about when we look at these two different spaces, right, something came up as we were creating them in that they almost look like selfie stations, right? <laughs> they could be to the outsider in, a, in an almost offensive way. But what I want to think about is, you know, that's actually not offensive to me. These spaces are exotic and different to most people. But I want them to think about, like, how are these spaces, how do we as workers actually interact with these objects. These are spaces of survival for us. This is how we make our money to put bread on the table to get our kids to school. So I want people to start thinking about that. It's like, how are these sets spaces of, that, that can, are spaces of continuation for us? Um, so I would love for you to interact with the space, read the quotes from the Red Canary Song members that are on the walls about um, specific objects that are around. Some of the things though aren't spoken, aren't written about, um, such as the rice cooker over here in the massage parlor. And I point that out because the rice cooker seems like such a you know utilitarian, um, quotidian piece of nurturance. It's a, a tool we we probably all have one. However, it's also a tool of evidence from when police, people, when police go into parlors to say that these people are trafficked and head held against their will because obviously they have a rice cooker. They have food in their fridge. That means they must be being held in this spa against their will. So we want to take a look at these objects that, um, that are then taken by the police state and fetishized for their own use. Mm. Right to to in, incarcerate us. Also, same as in the in the, um, in the uh, <laughs> king space. One, a few of the thing items are the strap on. Mm. All right, the strap on is a symbol for police workers to come after um, to come after dominatrixes to show that there's actual penetrative sex happening. Now we're not talking about the usual penetrative sex. So we're we're looking at the police state coming after what we deem as queer sex. And that that's what they're using against us in our lifestyles. Um, so 
I actually was around and, and working in, in the city during 2007 when there was um, a flood of raids happening against uh, dominatrixes. And we all gathered up all of our dildos and put them into these big buckets to get them out of our spaces, thinking that this is how they're going to come after us is because of the penetrative sex. However, it didn't matter. It didn't matter because there are, so many, there are so many laws about what parts of the body are erotic and what are not. And so somebody who was simply touching the chest, not even going towards the nipple, but just simply touching the person on their chest, then became arrested. We don't know. There, these, these are the types of laws that can shift all the time. So I want you to take a look at these objects. Um, yeah, and just, just consider them. Consider how you interact with them. Consider how they are tools for our, our work. Thank you.